Welcome to this presentation on the pelvis and sacroiliac joint. I'm going to start by looking at some basic principles of anatomy, really as a foundation for our further work. The diagram on the right is a model skeleton and that on the left an x-ray of the pelvis. Now when we look closely at the model we can see that this is the lumbar spine, the lower part of the spine. This triangular area is the sacrum itself with a small tailbone, the coccyx on the base here. These are the two wings of the pelvis and these wings are called the iliac bones. As a consequence the sacroiliac joint is the junction between the sacrum and the iliac bone. If we look at the x-ray, firstly we must remember that on an x-ray the denser and heavier bones are, the easier it is to see them. So we're looking at the sacrum here, although it's triangular, the lower part is thinner so it appears fainter on the x-ray. And just at the base here we can see the coccyx bone. To the side we have the ball and socket which is the hip joint. This curved area is the iliac bone we talked about from the sacrum. And so this thin line is the junction, the sacroiliac joint. Looking at the bones in more detail, here is our sacroiliac joint abbreviated to SIJ. This is the sacrum and we can start to see now that it actually is a number of bones fused together. So whereas the lumbar spine has these little points, the spinous processes, in the sacrum they're said to be rudimentary spinous processes. This is our tailbone, the coccyx. This is our sacroiliac joint with the rim of the pelvis, the ilium coming around here. These are the sockets of the hip joint called the acetabulum. These two are the sitting bones, the ischial tuberosities. And then we're looking at the front of the pelvis here, through to the front, and this is the pubic symphysis, which is the junction of the pelvis at the front. If we spin the pelvis round, we can see that pubic symphysis at the front the base of these U-shaped bones, this is the ischial tuberosity, the sitting bone. We can now see the cup of the hip joint more readily. This is our curved area that we saw on the x-ray, the sacroiliac joint, and these are the front parts of the lumbar vertebrae. So these are the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae. We spin the model round again now what we'll do is put on the overlying muscle. So to start with, the grey areas are the ligaments. So the ligaments stretch across the sacroiliac joint. This particular triangular ligament here attaches from the ischial tuberosity to the sacrum. So we call it the sacrotuberous ligament. On this side, it's partially covered by the multifidus muscle. Now there are multifidi on both sides of the spine and they broaden out towards the base to form this triangular thick area called the multifidus triangle. Beneath the sacroiliac joint and beneath the sacrotuberous ligament lying under it we have the piriformis muscle and the piriformis muscle is important for back conditions because between it and the sacrotuberous ligament we have the sciatic nerve and sometimes the sciatic nerve can be trapped in that area. From the rim of the pelvis here coming up to the lower ribs that we can just see peeking out the top of the diagram we have the quadratus lumborum muscle. Putting on another layer of muscles what we have here then is the quadratus lumborum muscle that we just mentioned, but it is, it is now covered by the erector spinal muscles, and these are the superficial ones that you can touch. So the rim of the pelvis here is 
um, hidden by the connection of the erector spinae. And this red part of the muscle is what we call the muscle belly, and it comes down and becomes fibrous as it attaches into the bone. And we can see that these muscles, which have been stripped out on the left side, actually cover all of the lumbar vertebrae. So we're seeing the lumbar bodies here, and we're seeing the transverse processes here and then as we go up further we can see the ends of the ribs are covered by the muscles. Now that's all well and good from the point of your theory but in the clinic we don't have the facility to peel the skin off we feel with our hands so the important thing is what we can feel by touching or officially the title would be palpation. So we can see what's known as the most superficial parts of the bone, the superficial bony landmarks. So we're seeing here the tips of the spinous processes and we'll be able to feel those just above and below the waistband. We can feel the iliac crest on this side and then this crest comes round and finishes at a point of bone called the posterior superior iliac spine. So it's on the back of the body, so it's called posterior. It's at the top of the sacrum, so it's called superior. And then it's called the iliac because it is associated with the iliac bone and the spine because it's pointed. The base here, we've got the tip of the coccyx bone, the tailbone, which comes just above the buttock crease. And then further down, we have the sitting bone, the ischial tuberosity, which will be on either side. And then if we take the buttock crease round to the side, we will be able to feel the greater trochanter, which is a thick knobble of bone, which we often feel if we lie on our sides on a firm surface. Let's look now at the side and we can see the sacroiliac joint in a little more detail. So this is the sacrum in side view and now we can see these rudimentary spinous processes of the sacrum that we call the spinous tubercles. On the edge of the sacrum we have a triangular area that is half of the sacroiliac joint, and that matches with a similar triangular area on the wing of the pelvis, on the iliac bone. So here, this is our ischial tuberosity. This is half of the pubic symphysis, the joint at the front of the body, and these two flat shape bones form our sacroiliac joint. We'll put a few details here. Firstly, to say that it is a synovial joint, so it contains fluid, much like your knee or your hip, and as a consequence, it can move, although it will move only slightly. The cartilage is fairly thick, giving the joint a little spring, but also meaning that the joint is fairly firmly fixed unless we soften that cartilage and that's exactly what will happen to the fibrous um, tissues and the ligaments during pregnancy and the capsule itself the bag which surrounds the joint is thickened into a thick ligament and again that will soften during pregnancy let's look now at the shape of the pelvis as a whole we're looking from above down, so this is our sacrum, and we've cut through the lumbar spine. And we can see clearly now then, the two iliac bones join together, and they join together at three points, the sacroiliac joint on either side, and the pubic symphysis at the front. So any movement or any disruption which happens to the pubic symphysis will happen to the sacroiliac joints 
And similarly, anything which happens to the sacroiliac joint will happen to the pubic symphysis. Now, because of the requirements of childbirth and the need for the baby to pass through the pelvis, the pelvis of the female is wider than that of the male. However, there are variations between individuals in the sexes. So some individuals naturally have a more narrow pelvis. So you may have a girl with a particularly narrow pelvis, for example. Equally, some individuals have a particularly wide pelvis. So you may have a man with a wider pelvis. So there are pelvic changes between the sexes, but there are also pelvic changes or variations within the sexes themselves. Now the shape of the pelvis is important, but also the orientation of the pelvis, how the pelvis sits in terms of pelvic tilt, which we will look at later. And this will be affected by posture and it will be affected by the way that the person moves, the so-called movement pattern. In addition to changes in the way that an individual moves, there are also changes in the bony formation in this area. So as many as 30% of individuals may have what's known as an accessory articulation. In other words, a, an additional joint so if we look here, this is the last lumbar vertebrae, what we call L5. And at the side, we have this small wing, which is the transverse process. It comes quite close to the back of the sacrum, the posterior superior iliac spine that we mentioned earlier. And in some individuals, this can actually form a joint. Now, that may be a movable joint, or it may be a joint which has become less movable and very stiff, or completely fixed. And in some individuals, you may have a joint which is fixed on both sides. Now, clinically, that's important because if we're trying to assess the movement which occurs between the spine and the pelvis, and we're comparing this to a normal, if an individual has a fixed joint on one side, that pelvis will be stiff and we won't be able to increase the movement. So there'd be no point in giving mobility exercises or mobility techniques to an individual where the lumbar vertebra is fixed to the sacrum. Clearly, we're not going to know that unless we x-ray, but it is an important feature to consider with a client where you suspect that the movement isn't increasing at the rate you would normally expect. And equally, it's a reason to just be slow in this area and not to force movement in any way. Let's look now at some of the clinical conditions which can affect the sacroiliac joint. The first is um, inflammation of the sacroiliac joint and inflammation um, tends to be called itis and so inflammation of the sacroiliac joint is sacroiliitis. This can occur um, as with most things um, affecting the sacroiliac joint and pelvis um, after pregnancy but it can also occur in conditions where a person has fallen onto their backside, perhaps in skiing or skateboarding, somebody who has um, been sitting for a long time in a very firm seat, uh, somebody who slipped on the ice and skated on their, on, on their bottom in the winter. So sacroiliitis, inflammation of the sacroiliac joint, tends to be made worse by prolonged standing where you're favouring one hip and um, predominantly placing the weight on one leg. Prolonged sitting, particularly on a firm surface, so you may have um, a small amount of pain which gets considerably worse if you've been sitting in a restaurant or in the cinema, for example. Second thing that we can see is excessive movement of the joint. 
We mentioned briefly that the sacroiliac joint will move during childbirth. And the reason for this is that a hormone is released called relaxin, which will soften the ligaments holding the sacroiliac joint and the pelvis in general. This will allow the pelvis to broaden during childbirth to allow the baby to come through the mum's pelvis. After pregnancy, the hormone is still in the bloodstream and the effect of the hormone can last for between three and six months after childbirth. As a consequence, there can be too much movement of the sacroiliac joint and when we get too much movement without the muscle tone to control it, we call that instability. Now this leads us to our third condition where when the hormone levels start to calm down, the ligaments will gradually stiffen again and the pelvis becomes less mobile. However, if there is a positional fault in the pelvis where one sacroiliac joint is stiffer than the other or one has moved more than the other, the pelvis may well be fixed with that fault. So examples of that would be an upslip where one half of the pelvis is higher than the other, a sacral torsion where one half of the pelvis is twisted relative to the other. So these are all things which a physiotherapist would assess, uh, particularly after pregnancy. But these can also occur after an injury such as uh, falling from a horse, falling from a bike, anything where the hip has been moved outwards into abduction during the fall. We mentioned that things which affect the sacroiliac joint also affect the joint of the pubis and symphysis pubis dysfunction is a condition where the pubic joint has become inflamed or has become painful in general and this can again occur after childbirth but can also occur during trauma and an x-ray will often reveal that the pubic symphysis hasn't closed correctly so it, the joint itself is wider than it should be and this is often tested with uh, an x-ray where the client is standing on one leg so-called stalk x-ray but a physiotherapist will also assess the position of one of the um, rims of the pubic uh, area, the so-called pubic rami, one relative to the other to discover if there is a positional fault. So these are the sorts of things which may cause problems in the sacroiliac joint and as a consequence when we're taking a patient's history these are the sorts of things that we would look for. So someone who slipped and jarred either their leg or their pelvis. So a typical scenario would be someone who slipped on the ice and fell onto their buttock. Someone who jarred their leg, say they're out walking their dog and they um, stepped off the curb and they missed the curb or they were walking downstairs and they missed the lower step and they came down heavily onto one heel. Someone who slept awkwardly, um, as we lie on the side, the top leg tends to move forwards and down, which twists the pelvis. And if we have a particularly soft mattress or if we slept awkwardly for some reason, that can book stress onto the pelvis. Where there's been prolonged sanding or sitting, um, when I say prolonged, that would be something which is unusual for that particular individual. So someone, for example, who works in an office and they've been asked to stand on the, uh, you know, at a trade show or something for four or five hours, they're not used to that. Their pelvis isn't used to that. And so as a consequence, it can, it can complain. Childbirth is the big, big thing um, that causes pelvic problems. And lifting, again, um, something which is um, unfamiliar 
to an individual. So someone who suddenly starts to join a gym, for example, and they're lifting a weight that they're not normally used to, that can cause problems. So your client may complain of any of these, but often they will not recollect what's happened to them. So these are the sorts of things that they may feel. So pain to one side of the lower back, moving into the buttock and often traveling to the front. So they may say, well, I have pain in my hip. And when you look at it, it's actually pain from the back referred into the hip. So pain traveling forwards. They may feel pain in the leg or just in the groin area. Both of those pains can be made worse by prolonged sitting and standing, particularly where somebody is slouch standing, um, so-called sway back posture, where they're standing and favoring one leg. Pain will often be made worse where the knees are apart, so the hips are abducted. So typically somebody who's sitting on a seat um, in a pair of jeans and their knees are apart, say in the pub, something like this, when they come to, um, to stand up, they may find that they've got problems. And often individuals, particularly with sacroiliac instability, are rather embarrassed and they sort of say, well, my pelvis feels as though it's going to fall apart. And they've often identified to themselves that if they wear tighter clothing or a, um, a pair of trousers with a tighter waistband or a tight belt, sometimes this makes it feel better. It's almost as though it, it's pulling them together again. So the sorts of things that will cause pubic symphysis dysfunction are fairly similar to those described for sacroiliac joint problems. And remember we said that it would be very unusual to have one condition without the other because we know that the pelvis really forms a circle of the two pelvic rims connected at the back by the sacroiliac joints and connected at the front by the pubic symphysis. So ligamentous laxity after pregnancy due to the release of relaxin and progesterone hormones. Now, during menstruation, these are also released. So girls will often find that if they do have pubic symphysis pain, it's made worse during their sort of time of the month. It can also be affected by the contraceptive pill. You may get changes in the way that a person actually feels pain. So this is something which is quite unfamiliar. You know, if you've had a muscle tear or a knee pain, you know what's happening. But where it is um, pain around the pelvis, it's um, quite a personal area. And it's an area where you may not be familiar with this type of pain. So it's as well just to have patience with, with clients um, as they're explaining this, because they may not be able to explain exactly what they're feeling. The excessive movement that we called instability may be due to the joints, but it can also be due to those muscles which we saw on the diagram overlay those joints. So the multifidus muscles, the abdominal muscles, the piriformis muscles, the erector spinae muscles, if these aren't working, after, uh, working correctly after an injury, they can um, cause um, pelvic instability and lower back instability. Frequently what happens is that if they're not working, they'll be working more or less on one side and that leads to asymmetry. So an individual will say, well, I've got pain more on one side of the pelvis than on the other side. And that may chop and change depending on their posture. So they might sort of say, well, you know, when I made the appointment, the pain was on the right side, but I've come three days later and now the pain is on the left. The final thing to consider is the position that an individual was in when they gave birth. Um, because this can affect what caused the pain, but also if they've had this in a prior childbirth and they're due to give birth again, it would be worthwhile in the birthing plan just seeing if the position can be changed if at all possible. 
the classic position with the knees apart and the hips flexed unfortunately is one which doesn't favor the sacroiliac joint so if a mum's had sacroiliac problems or pelvic problems in the past there are alternative positions which can be used and it's worthwhile talking with a woman's health physiotherapist and with a midwife to try to see if there's anything that can be worked out during the birthing plan prior to childbirth. So we mentioned that the joint at the front, the pubic symphysis, can be a cause of problems. Now, we know that the pelvis becomes more flexible before and during childbirth in order to facilitate the passage of the baby's head through the pelvis. We know that this is the result of the release of hormones, particularly relaxin and progesterone, and that these hormones are released during the menstrual cycle. So these are the sorts of things that we have in the back of our mind. Now, normally the pubic symphysis should be about two to three millimeters in width, but in pubic symphysis dysfunction, this can increase and when it increases, we have a separate condition called diastasis symphysis pubis, and it can increase up to one centimeter during pregnancy. Normally, that would go back to its normal range of two to three millimeters, but in some instances, it can take considerably longer. So in terms of normal values, we would want to see the pubic symphysis reducing down below one centimeter in width after about three to five months. If it hasn't done that, then we would say that that was abnormal. What is more important is asymmetry. So where one side of the pubic symphysis is higher than the other, as assessed by a physio, um, that becomes important and both the width of the pubic symphysis and asymmetry of the pubic symphysis can be assessed by x-ray but that instability can be missed if the x-ray isn't taken with the client standing on one leg the so-called flamingo or stalk x-ray so we're looking here then at x-rays of the pelvis just to orientate ourselves on the normal subject then here we have the rim of the pelvis on either side this is our triangular bone the sacrum here we have the hip joints the base here we have the sitting bones the ischial tuberosity and this is the pubic symphysis at the front which should be around about two to three centimeter, uh, three uh, millimeters in width. So this is a normal pubic symphysis. This is an excessive gap. So this is diastasis symphysis pubis, where the pubic symphysis has moved apart. And this is what we're seeing on an X-ray standing on one leg. So this person stands on this leg. This one is slightly higher up and you can see that the gap has increased, tipped slightly, and this side is significantly higher than this one. So we've got a combination of an excessive gap, the asymmetry, because one has moved higher than the other, and the fact that it is able to move, so the instability. So this person will have pain, but they'll also have considerable loss of function when they're standing on one leg, either standing for a prolonged period or when walking, particularly when coming downstairs where they're taking their weight on one leg, trying to control their body weight as it lowers down. So in the clinic, we would assess this with a variety of different tests. No one test will give us all the information, but the information we gain from a number of tests together becomes very, very accurate. 
So our subject is lying on one side and what we're doing here is compressing. So the therapist is pressing through the rim of the pelvis. The pelvis is pressing on a firm surface on the other side and so any give between those two pressures is a result of the sacroiliac joint. So by pushing on the pelvic rim we're stretching the ligaments which control and limit the movement of the sacroiliac joint itself. What we're doing here then is a similar thing so this is a gapping test so by placing one arm across the other as the therapist pushes down the movement goes in a v-shape and that will cause the sacroiliac joint to move apart if the therapist had been putting their hands normally then they could press down and they would mimic the compression test that we did. So where we push the pelvic rims together that would be compression. Where we cross the hands and push them apart that is gapping. So what we're seeing here then is gapping of the sacroiliac joint and it's particularly those ligaments at the front of the joint which tends to be affected. What we're doing here is what's known as a P4 test. P4 standing for posterior pelvic pain provocation. So we're looking at pain in the back of the pelvis. And what we're doing is compressing through the thigh bone, through the femur. And on a firm surface, we press on the, the um, ischial tuberosity and the sacrum push onto the surface and any give is in the sacroiliac joint. So the pressure has to be directly through the joint and we get a shearing stress onto the sacroiliac joint. Now this test wouldn't be appropriate in an individual who had hip pain or a hip uh, condition or a hip, um, as we would officially say, a hip pathology. It would only be um, useful on uh, someone with a healthy hip um, or an athlete. This is the Faber test, and Faber stands for flexion, abduction, and external rotation. So the hip joint here is moved upwards, outwards, and twisted. So the hand here stabilizes the pelvis. The hand here has used the femur, the thigh bone, as a lever. So the, the foot is on the thigh to stop the um, the leg from dangling, the, but we could also put the foot um, on the couch or um, on a small block on, on the couch. Uh, again, this particular test would only be relevant to somebody who doesn't have a hip pathology. But what's happening here is we're pressing down, causing a shearing stress onto both the hip and the sacroiliac joint itself. Now, all of these tests, of course, are done with the weight off the pelvis. So um, we're being cautious if the person has pain, which is a good thing. But of course, the patient normally has pain when they're standing. So we would say that these are non-functional tests. This next test, the drop test, mimics the position that the patient will often be in when they get pain. So what they're doing here is to lift up onto their toes and then lock, they're dropping heavily onto the heel, putting a shock wave up the straight leg into the sacroiliac joint. And this will often mimic the pain. So we would start the individual up just by lifting for perhaps one centimeter, gradually building up until they, they lift by a couple of centimeters, initially with a slow control drop, beating, building up the speed of the drop. And eventually we can mimic the pain and they'll often um, say, oh, yes, that's, that's, that's my pain, as it were. So having established that the individual has pain in the sacroiliac joint, remembering that 
pain in the sacroiliac joint is related to conditions in the pubic symphysis as well the 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 question is what do we do about it when pain is very intense we can use modalities which are designed to reduce inflammation and pain within that joint so for example physiotherapists will often use electric machines such as ultrasound to reduce the inflammation and medical acupuncture to try to reduce pain often they may use something such as tens for example with a patient at home and all of these are used to reduce pain but at some stage we need to form a rehabilitation program and in order to do that we have to understand the way that the pelvis holds itself together and there are two methods of the sacroiliac joint stabilizing itself the first is called form closure the second force closure form closure then is simply that which exists because of the shape of the bone around the joints so we said that the sacrum is at the back here the rim of the pelvis comes around the front with the pubic symphysis here this forms an arch with this the the sacrum as the keystone really of that arch now, when the sacroiliac joint becomes unstable and painful, one of the things that we can do is to use a sacroiliac belt to firmly bind around the pelvis to hold that stable, or we can use taping to try to hold that in. And that will reduce movement of the sacroiliac joint and allow the pain to subside. Once that's happened, we use force closure, and force closure is the ability of the body to stabilize the joint themselves through the pull of muscles and through the pull of muscles which attach into these thick areas that we looked at in that first diagram where we said that the muscle was red and the fascia was the white fibrous area and it's fascia which covers this joint and so we can use um, exercises to try to strengthen and tighten the muscles which pass across this area and which attach into the fascia covering that area and the fascia which covers the sacroiliac joint has the multifidus muscles and the thoracolumbar fascia pulling into this area. So the multifidus was the inner spinal muscle which we saw covering the sacrum. The thoracolumbar fascia is the fascia which connects to the back muscles but also forms a connection to your oblique abdominal muscles and a particular muscle called the transversus abdominis. The base of this fascia actually attaches to the hamstring muscles. So hip and leg exercises are important for the health and the rehabilitation of the sacroiliac joint. And if we zoom out slightly, we can see that this triangular area is the thoracolumbar fascia and we have the large shoulder and back muscles attaching here so we've got the latissimus dorsi attaching into the thoracolumbar fascia and then we have the erector spiny attaching the tension formed by those muscles will pull onto the fascia and will pull across the sacroiliac joint to hold it together and then in the base of the fascia we have the hamstrings and the powerful buttock muscles the gluteus maximus attaching so these will pull onto the fascia and help to create force over the sacroiliac joint and to stabilize it and then finally from the front we have muscles which attach which will stabilize both the sacroiliac joint and the pubic symphysis so we have the oblique abdominals and we have the muscles which draw the knees together the adductor muscles 
and a small deep hip muscle called the gluteus medius and these are important for stability of the joint particularly when an individual is standing on one leg and finally then we have perhaps the most important system and this involves intra-abdominal pressure an intra-abdominal pressure normally called the abdominal balloon is a pressure which exists in the abdomen through contraction of the deep abdominal muscles so the transversus abdominis muscle particularly and the internal oblique muscle will contract and they will form a cylinder which is formed by the diaphragm muscle at the top the pelvic floor muscles at the base and the abdominal muscles which surround the drum and rehabilitation of this mechanism so-called core stability is vital for the health of the lumbar spine the pelvis and the sacroiliac joint now we've mentioned pregnancy as a cause of problems we've mentioned falling particularly onto the backside or onto one heel and jarring the leg the other thing which is important to this mechanism is if these muscles have been cut so if there's been spinal surgery or if there's been a hernia or where there is obesity so let's look at how we can use these muscles during rehabilitation and focus on core stability training for a while one of the first things that we have to appreciate is that the abdominal muscles can broadly be categorized as two groups when we see an individual go into the gym and perform sit-up exercises or do um, movements with weights or movements uh, in an aerobics class on the whole they're using their abdominal muscles to create movement and that tends to emphasize the superficial muscles the so-called washboard muscles are uh, at the front of the abdomen now that's not a problem but what we're interested in is to stabilize the pelvis and the lower spine and in order to do that we want to use these muscles not to create movement but to prevent unnecessary movement so core stability uses the deeper abdominal muscles the so-called dynamic corset muscles rather than the washboard muscles both sets of muscles are important to spinal health but during these early stages of rehabilitation we want to emphasize the dynamic corset muscles because these are the ones which will stabilize the pelvis and as a consequence they will reduce our clients pain so what we need to do is to teach our clients how to recruit these muscles how to switch these muscles on and we do that using an exercise which mimics the abdominal balloon technique that we mentioned and briefly what we would do is to contract the pelvic floor muscles as though we're trying to stop water passing water then at the same time we draw the tummy button inwards as though we were trying to pull the abdomen away from the waistband of the trousers while breathing normally and we call that an abdominal hollowing action once we've built that up and re-educated that we then use that as our stable base and start to move the legs or arms so in this diagram where our client is performing a classic exercise called a heel slide so they're lying on their back so the, the back is supported because that's the area which is which is painful they're monitoring the curve of the of the um, lower back the lumbar lordosis using a little machine called a pressure biofeedback 
what they're then doing is moving their legs while at the same time trying to stop the pelvis from tilting and the spine from moving. So we're trying to maintain that position as the legs move, and in this case the heels are sliding away from the body and sliding back onto the body. Because these muscles work over a period of time, rather than performing a great number of them, so-called high repetition exercises, we would perform just a few but hold them for a long time. So we might perform 10 repetitions holding each repetition for 10 seconds, for example. And for core stability exercises, we would choose a position that is comfortable for our client. And there are a number which we can choose. So where the client is lying on the back, the advantage is that we can press into the abdominal muscles to draw their attention to this. So we can use something called tactile cueing or um, cueing the muscle using touch. Where you have a lean individual, they may be able to pull their abdomen away from the floor or the couch. So lying on the front may be approaching. When an individual is overweight, then standing is a better position, drawing the abdomen in away from a belt and they can stand with their back onto a wall. And kneeling on all fours, again pulling away from a belt, can be a particularly useful position because the spine is supported in that kneeling position. We can also use the side muscles, so we're using the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique and the external oblique on one side, together with that small muscle, the quadratus lumborum that we identified early on. And these exercises are side bridge exercises or often called horizontal side support movements. And these can be particularly important for individuals who carry objects in one hand because they will strengthen one side relative to the other. So in diagram one here, all the individuals doing is propping themselves up onto one elbow and one hip. They then lift that hip up to form a straight line to prop themselves on the elbow and the knee. And finally, they lift themselves up to prop themselves up onto the feet and onto the hand. And that then uses these muscles beneath to form the support of the bridge created by the angled body. So that's a quick run through a couple of conditions that can be a cause of low back pain and conditions affecting the pelvis. For further material, you can read um, three of my books, The Complete Guide to Sports Injuries, Managing Sports Injuries and Back Stability. Back Stability is published by Human Kinetics, Managing Sports Injuries by Elsevier and The Complete Guide to Sports Injuries by ANC Black. For further details, please visit my website www.norrisassociates.co.uk. Many thanks for your attention.